So, hello everyone. I'm Justin Robertson. I'm a member of the Department of Asian and International Studies and a part of the residential system at uh, CityU. And we're pleased to host tonight's event. Uh, and we're doing this in cooperation with Kaduri Farm and Schumacher College. Given that Satish has spent a lifetime thinking about the meaning of education, uh, it seemed fitting that one of his stops on this trip should be at a university. Um, this is a particularly tense time for students with end of semester assignments. Um, but we're pleased that we have quite a few of you here to listen and to reflect on Satish's ideas. For those of you who met Satish on his last uh, visit to Hong Kong, I hope that in the interim you've used your hands more, as he asked us to. Uh, my one small contribution here is that I've been taking my students to a number of farms in the New Territories, and we've been getting our hands dirty, so to speak, relatively in Hong Kong, and that's been quite useful. Tonight, Satish is going to speak to us for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. A few people saw the poster that I designed for this evening and thought dinner came along with the talk. Unfortunately, it does not. Um, it was perhaps slightly misleading. However, we will be serving Chinese dessert afterwards, so if you do have the time, please join us outside for a chance to speak to Satish more informally. So can I ask us to raise our hands and welcome Satish to City U. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just give the last microphone. What do you think? Yeah. Or maybe I'll give a little, little, um, little uh, support from it. Thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to uh, speak to you. And uh, uh, today, this evening, we are going to talk about food and everything related to it. I would like to start with my own connection with food. Of course, we all have connection with food. <laughs> Anybody breathalians here? Have you heard of breathalians? You've never heard of breathalians? Breathalians are those who live by breath alone. <laughs> so, we all have connection with food then. There's nobody breathalian here. But my connection with food in terms of growing, my mother was a small farmer. She had about four acres of land in the deserts of Rajasthan where monsoon came only about 30 days or 40 days in a year. So the remaining 325 days were dry. And so those were the very precious months. And every drop of water was saved. And, uh, and we went, but, uh, when the monsoon started, we went, and my mother would take me. I was, I remember my memory at that time, I was five years old, six years old, which I remember. And uh, she grew sesame, wonderful sesame, melons all kinds of melons, millets, different kind of millets. In the desert of Rajasthan, you can't grow rice, which you love here in Hong Kong and China and Japan and also many parts of India. But we grew millets, which was very healthy. And, uh, <clears throat> but rest of India is not like Rajasthan. The rest of India is very fertile. Some of the parts of India, we can grow three crops a year. Three crops a year. And so we have rice in the same field, and then wheat in the same field, and then in between, some vegetables. And areas where we grow three crops, we don't grow just one crop, like wheat or rice. While we are growing wheat and rice, in places, there is a millet, there is a lentils, uh, there are herbs, there are fruits, uh, there are vegetables, there are everything. So it's a traditional way of farming in India, which my mother used to do, but um, even more than in Rajasthan, in places like Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, South India. These are very biodiverse farms that I witnessed in my young age. 
And so, um, when I moved to England, originally I was in London, and then um, I became editor of Resurgence magazine. And uh, after question answer, you will see a little uh, video of uh, the magazine, about the magazine. And uh, also there are magazines, uh, copies outside there. So I, I became editor of Resurgence. And in it, we had a tremendous uh, number of articles about food and farming and agriculture. Particularly, my mentor and friend, E.F. Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful, and after his name, we started Schumacher College, where you have been and many others have been. And so he was the president of the Soil Association. And the Soil Association is one great organization in Britain promoting organic agriculture and, and biodiverse farming, but particularly organic. And so he was my friend. And I said, living in London, we can't grow food here. Uh, we should move out and produce the magazine from the rural village where we can have a garden. So we found a house with two acres, half of what my mother used to have. Uh, but two acres is actually a big garden. You can grow quite a lot. And so we started this garden. We uh, lo planted lots of apple trees and, and pears and plums. And, and we had a big vegetable garden, herb garden, and so um, we grow now almost 70 to 80 percent of our family vegetables and food can come from this garden. And so we grow our own potatoes and onions and garlic and carrots and, and, um, and asparagus and beans and peas and uh, cabbages and, and spinach and raspberries, strawberries, black currants, red currants, you name all the vegetables. And I tell you, uh, 10 minutes before I start to cook, and I love cooking, I enjoy cooking. And even at Shimahu College, sometimes I cook for 30, 40 people uh, with a group of three or four uh, um, uh, assistants and helpers working with me. And so I love cooking. And my greatest luxury is to go in the garden and choose freshly inviting vegetables, pick them, bring them into the kitchen, lightly cook them, and enjoy those vegetables. I tell you, the taste of fresh vegetables, picked 10 minutes before you cook, is something quite different than the vegetables you buy in your supermarket, wrapped in plastic, picked nobody knows how long ago two days, three days, four days, five days. And the most important quality of this kind of food is not the freshness of food, but the shelf life. They call it shelf life. How long it can last on the shelf. I prefer my luxury, my most wonderful way is to go in the garden 10 minutes before I cook and pick the fresh vegetables. And so, uh, food is very close to my heart. And when we are thinking about food, we all want to eat, we all need to eat, we all do eat, but many of us, increasing number of us, do not want to go. Increasingly, the number of people who are on the land growing food, gardeners and farmers are decreasing year after year. Now in a country like England, where I live, only about 2% of people are on the land. So 98% of people are depending on this 2% of people to feed them. I think this is not the way to feed the world. And those 2% of people who are on the land, they find it very hard to make a living. Their farming has to be what is called subsidized. And even with subsidized EU and uh, British government, even after subsidies, their income is very low. 
a banker in the city of London will get, it's anybody's guess, how much he is paid. And mostly he. Say they will get 10,000 UK pounds, which is, I don't know how many uh, uh, Hong Kong dollars it will be. If they will get 10,000 pounds a day, and a farmer, a farmer, if he or she gets 100 pounds a day, they will feel very well off. Now, why this discrepancy? Why should a banker be paid 10,000 pounds a day? And why a farmer who is growing our food, and we cannot survive without food, you can't eat your plastic uh, card, American Express, or Visa, or whatever card you have. You can't eat it. You can't eat your figures or your computer. You have to eat real food. But the farmers, in my view, if you want to feed the world, give dignity to farmers, give respect to the farmers, and let farmer be paid 10,000 pounds a day and let the bankers be paid 100 pounds a day. Would you agree to that? Would you not? Because we can't live by plastic money. We have to live by real food. And then I would like that every school, every university, Hong Kong universities included, every school, every university must have a farm associated with it. And all our children, and I'm glad to hear that you talked about your hands getting dirty. Please always remember, dirt is not dirty. Dirt is sacred. Dirt is where our food, our nutrition comes from. Entire life system depends on that two, three inches of topsoil. If that topsoil, which don't know anything about the soil, we don't care, we take it for granted, we ignore it. We don't think that the soil is important. We go and work in big offices and we sit in front of a computer and we think this is very important. But that topsoil, that three inches of topsoil, is the lifeline for the whole of living world. Not only the human world. That topsoil is feeding not only the humans, but all living species, animals, birds. And from that topsoil comes the trees. And so everything depends on that. And so I would say that if every school, every university had a, a, a farm, a field associated with it, that will allow our young people to learn to grow food. And I think we need to bring back that dignity, the essential importance, the imperative of growing food. Even if you are working one hour on the land, even if it is one or two days on the land, part-time, I'm not asking that everybody has to be full-time farmers, but all of us need to have some time touching the soil, being out in nature. And so um, I started a school in England called the small school and I said our school must have a garden before we have a science lab and I'm not against science lab we do have a science lab and before we have all the other classrooms we will create a school where there's a garden and there's a kitchen kitchen is the center of the school and I said the first, very first day and I started the school nearly um, uh, near in 1982, so nearly 30 years ago. And for 30 years, children and teachers are cooking their meal every day. Fresh vegetables and herbs from the garden. And the quality of their education improves. You cannot provide good education on bad diet. If your university students, if your school children are eating plastic, food packaged in plastic, wrapped in plastic, coming from a plastic cup and a plastic plate and a plastic spoon which you eat and throw away. 
what a waste you are creating to the environment and it's not good taste, it's not nutrition. And so increasing amount of ill health is there because of our disconnection, our disconnection from the land, from nature, from the environment, from animals, from the soil. And so reconnecting with the soil, reconnecting, getting back to a little bit of nature and being out, it is good for our mind, it's good for our health, we good for our uh, for, for our our uh, psyche, good for our relationship, and you get good food. And so every school, like the small school I started, we said let's have a garden, let's have a kitchen. And the same thing with the Srimakar College. I said Srimakar College must have a garden. And all the students who are coming to Srimakar College, they are participating in the cooking and the cleaning. And I say that college is not a college is not an institution. Schumacher College is a home. Let the students feel they are at home. And what you do at home, you go in the kitchen. And your mother and your parents, and they are in the kitchen, provide you good, nutritious food. In Italian language, if you say food is delicious, you don't say food is delicious. They say food is like home cooking home. So make your university a home for your students and make them and, and invite them to participate in the cooking. Can you imagine this university having students participate in the cooking, having a kitchen? You have all these lecture rooms and, and big, big places where there's no kitchen. Is there a kitchen somewhere where teachers and students and, and professors and, and, uh, and uh, young people and older people together can prepare a nice meal and sit together and share their food. Am I dreaming? Is it too utopian? It's too idealistic? Too unrealistic? What the realists have done to us? What is the result of realism? What have the realists done? More ill health, more congestion, more um, uh, frustration, more alienation and young people not knowing what to do with their lives, what is the meaning of their life, what is the purpose of their life, what are they growing for, what is life is going to bring them. Education, we are teaching children just to pass exams to get a good job. What is a good job? Not a good job which will satisfy you, which will make you happy, will bring you wellness and will use your imagination and help to your creativity. That is not a good job. Good job is meaning a bad job what we call good job, the bad job. Only thing it will do is to bring you some, some good salary and good pay and, and that's it. I think education has to be challenged and I'm in the, in the kind of university here and I'm challenging you um, the, the, the concept of education. Education should be not just the head, not just information, not just googling to get your information or just other information about business or information about technology. That's all mostly the information that you are getting. Uh, most universities are giving tremendously prominent place to business studies and the technological studies. But all other studies, whether growing food or cooking food or art or culture or humanities or poetry or, or music or dance or a theater or all other great qualities that we need in our life. And not only that, how to be compassionate, how to be kind, how to be respectful, how to relate to each other. We are not using any of those in our education. So it's a head-based education. So what I would like to see is not just head, but head, heart and hands. Heart is where you develop your relationship, your friendship, your quality of life, your respect for each other, and respect for the environment, and respect for nature, and reverence for life, and compassion for life, and care for the soil, and care for nature, your sea, your water, your mountains, your trees, your birds, everything is part of life. We human beings are suffering from great amount of arrogance. We think that human beings are so superior that all the other species should serve our needs. So we can cut down the rainforest as we like. We can pollute the oceans as we like. We can dam the rivers as we like. We can put the poison in our uh, land, um, chemicals, fertilizers, pesticide, herbicide, as we like, just to get very profit and get quick results. So we are treating the environment as if it was our slave. 
our property. And we human beings, just one species out of 8.4 million species, are ruling the earth. And the consequence is, as E.F. Schumacher said, that we feel that we are uh, in, a, uh, in a war against nature. We want to conquer nature. Conquering nature has become the project of the modern civilization. But even if we win the war against nature, we will be the losers. <clears throat> and so our, um, uh, our relationship with our environment, our natural world, comes with true food. And if we can go, go back to a way of life where even a small amount of time, even in a little bit of pots, uh, even by the, uh, by the wall, and there's a new way, and Kanuri Farm and Botanical Garden, where I'm staying, they, have, they are developing, and, uh, and Andy showed me today an example, where you can grow vegetables vertically along the wall. So every wall of Hong Kong should become an edible garden. How about that? That's the way to feed the world. Now, some people say, oh, we can do genetic engineering, we can do more chemicals. The amount of money spent, and chemicals come from the oil, and the oil is running out. All our eggs are put in one basket of energy from petroleum, from fossil fuel. And that oil, how long will it last? How long will it last? 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, even with fracking, we have reached a peak oil. The demand is growing and the supply is coming down. And we are not thinking anything. All our food, all our clothes, all our heating, all our lighting, all our transportation, everything is coming from one source of energy. And that one source is petroleum. And that runs out, all our civilization will collapse unless we think and invent a new way of living, a frugal, simple, elegant way of living and finding resources and energy from the natural world, like sun and the wind and the water and human energy. We are trying to save human energy because we think human energy is short supply. And we are trying to save time because we think that time is short supply. My friends, I have a news for you. Time is not in short supply. Can you remember this? When God made time, he or she made plenty of it. Please don't try to save time. But the resources, the energy we are using is in short supply. Try to save resources and energy and not time. Slow down. Do slowly things. The speed is a curse of our time. Slow down. Slow food, slow cities, slow life, slow learning. Even learning should be slow. In Sanskrit, we have an old saying, Shanai Pantha, Shanai Kantha, Shanai Parvat Mastake. Shanai Gyanam, Shanai Dhyanam, Panchai Tani, Shanai Shanai. Just a little introduction to Sanskrit language for you. Shanai means slow. Shanae, shanae, slow, slow. What is five things slowly you do? Shanae pantha, walk slowly. When you are in a speed walking, you don't look at anything. You don't see the flowers. You don't see the butterflies. You don't see the grasses of different kind. You don't see the trees. You don't see the birds sitting on the tree. You don't see the honey bees. You don't see it, but you are fast running somewhere to get somewhere. People go for jogging. I always advise them to go walking and not jogging, not running. Walking is better, in my view. So walk slowly. Shanae pantha. Shanae kantha. That's another. When you are sewing, and nowadays we don't sew. We have forgotten how to sew. We have to learn to sew, to mend our clothes. Just a little bit worn out, we throw it away, buy new, new fashion. We need to use less material. Material is close, sub, short supply, not time. And so, so, mend, but slowly. Use your needle and thread, and so and mend slowly. And Shanae Parvat Mastake, and we are climbing the mountain, and you have wonderful mountains and hills in uh, Hong Kong area, and, and the territory. And so, 
when you are climbing a mountain, go slowly. But more, the next two are even more important. Shanae Gana. And this is the lesson for all universities. Please, please uh, spread the word. Slow, Shanae Gana. Learn slowly. <laughs> Learn slowly. When somebody says, I'm a slow learner, they apologize. <laughs> they say, I'm a slow learner. Please forgive me, I'm a slow learner. No, no, thank you. I want to be a slow learner. I want to learn slowly. When you learn slowly, it stays with you. It gets into your heart. It gets into your guts. It gets your bones. It gets into your experience. It gets into your consciousness. Then the deep learning comes slowly. And this fast learning is superficial. It comes, goes, passing. Superficial information. So, shanay dhyanam. And the shanay dhyanam, meditation, slowly. Sometimes people come to Shimal College. First day, they arrive, and I teach meditation there. They come for meditation, and then they come out and say, Satish, I'm sorry, I couldn't meditate. I said, so your first day? Yes. You think you can learn to meditate one day, in one day? How long it take you to pass your BA? Oh, I started five years old, and now I'm BA. Uh, it's about, what, um, uh, uh, 15 years or something. I said, to pass BA you took 15 years, but you want to learn meditation in one day, one hour, half an hour. Shanae dhanam. Meditation comes slowly. Do it again, again, day after day, hour after hour. Be mindful, be mindful. Concentrate your mind here and now, in this moment, in this place, in this time, here, in your body, in your consciousness, in your mind, slowly. Here, this is not something you can do fast. Shanae dhanam. Panchay dai. Panch means five. These five things should be done slowly, slowly. Shanae, shanae. So speed, if you want to talk about food, growing food is not a matter of speed. You sow the seed, you wait. You wait. You are impatient, you cannot be a gardener. You are impatient, you cannot be a farmer. Wait until the seed has its time and it has taken the water, taken the sunshine, taken the moisture, taken its time to sprout and the seed is coming out with a little plant and then you come and you are in a rush and say, why, where are my potatoes? And where are my tomatoes? And where are my beans? No, wait. Nature teaches you patience. Nature, your, your computers and your Google teach you impatience. Quickly, and when, even if it takes you a second or two extra, say, oh, my computer is too slow. People tell me, when they want to show me something on the computer, and then it takes a kind of few seconds, and they, they apologize to me. Uh, so, so this is so slow. Why is slow? A few seconds. That plant coming out of the garden, so slow. And the next day, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. It takes five years, six years, ten years for that one apple seed to become a tree. And then branches, and then leaves, and then beautiful pink, white, beautiful aromatic blossom. And then eventually there is a green apple, and then sun and God, and a gardener, and a farmer, waiting, waiting, and that, that uh, green apple is becoming red apple, or yellow apple, and it's juicy, and it's crispy, and it's nutritious, and delicious. It did not happen quickly, but when you eat it, it's a great satisfaction. And then those apples fall, and the earthworms, and the soil is nourished with those apples and then all the leaves fall in the autumn at this time and the soil is nourished again time and the winter you are waiting the tree is just waiting for the spring to come and the spring is so happy to come and spring what does spring do to that apple tree or the cherry tree i was in japan last year at the cherry blossom time what does spring does to cherry tree it brings out. It helps to blossom. Naruda, the great poet, said, 
that we all have to be to each other and to nature what spring is to a cherry blossom. Neruda, remember. Can you be spring for the cherry blossom? That's a patience. That's how we feed the world. The world is not going to be fed by technology. World is not going to be fed by more tractors and machinery. We are taking away the agricultural land into buildings and airports and, and car parks and industrial estates and business parks and more buildings and more development. If the land is agricultural, we get undeveloped land. Undeveloped land. When you build a concrete glass structure, now we have developed it. We made some profit, make money, move on, the developer moves on wants to buy, grab new agricultural land to build more. That is not the way to feed the world. To feed the world, we have to protect our agricultural land. We have to cherish our land. We have to take care of our land. This, protect the soil. Nourish the soil. Feed the soil with your compost. What we do in our universities and schools, so much food is wasted. And what happens to that food? Go into the plastic bag. I don't know what you do here, but in many cities it is thrown on the, on the, on the um, landfills where it is producing greenhouse gases. That's, I would almost dare to say it's a crime against nature to throw away food, which is food for the soil. Any food, if, we, if, you, are, if you are interested in food, if you are interested in feeding the world, put that food back into the soil, compost. Everybody, before you learn physics, before you learn biology, before you learn psychology, anthropology, technology, any other logic, <laughs> you can include them all. Learn to make compost. Compostology comes at the top of my agenda. Compostology. Can you please, professors, students, demand your university to create a department for compostology in your university? That is. We need to make compost to treat the soil. That is the way to feed ourselves and our future generations and the world. And that way we can, we can participate in the process of food, in growing, in cooking, in eating, in celebrating. Just food is sacred. Food is not a petrol to your body, like you put petrol in the car. It's not a petrol, it's a sacred food. And when you are just sitting in front of your computer or in front of your television and just grabbing something and watching TV or something, that is not the way to feed the world. And that is not even to feed yourself. And that is not the way to respect the food. When food is in front of you, say some grace. Grace. To be gracious to food is an old tradition. We young, new generation, please remember, old traditions are not all bad. Old traditions, some of them are very good. Be gracious to your food and say grace. Thank you, soil. Thank you, earthworm. Without the earthworms, there will be no food on your table. You don't know about earthworms. Earthworms are the worms which were subject of Darwin's study. And Darwin became a famous scientist and, and the creator of uh, evolution theory. Who would you think? Who was greater? The earthworms or Darwin? It's earthworms which made the Darwin great scientist. We forget the earthworms. So I say, long live the earthworms. <laughs> without them, there will be no food on our table. And they work day and night without any wages. Have you ever seen earthworms going on strike? <laughs> Have you ever seen earthworms asking for a weekend holiday? They are working day and night, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, to keep our soil fertile and friable and good nourished quality. And so, we have to thank. So, when you are eating the food, you are saying this grace, thank you soil, thank you sunshine. Without a sunshine there will be no food, without a rain there will be no food. Without, a so without the gardeners and farmers there will be no food, and without the cooks there will be no food. So if we say that grace, and eat the food with that thanksgiving, with gratitude, your body will be good, your mind will be good, your health will be good, your psyche will be good. Slow down. The meal time is a very precious and sacred time. 
eat your food well. This is a very ordinary, ordinary thing that I am telling you. No big theory, no big science, no rocket science. Just asking you to slow down at the time of your meal and eat your meal mindfully. The mindfulness is the key to feeding the world. Mindfulness farming, mindfulness gardening, mindfulness cooking and mindfulness in eating. If we can have that, I think we can feed the world without any help from um, uh, uh, um, organic, uh, any help from these uh, fertilizers and pesticide and herbicide and any technology or anything else. So what I'm saying to you is common sense. What I'm saying to you is very simple. A, B, C. What I'm going to do is A, B, C, common sense. But unfortunately, common sense is no longer common. And therefore, I have to stand here and remind you these very simple truths that how we treat our food and how we grow our food. So let all universities connect themselves with food growing and cooking. Let all schools connect themselves with food growing. And people, uh, when I go to big businesses, and I was in one of them today, uh, when I go to big businesses, sometimes I ask them, are you a company? They say, yes, yes, we are a company, we are a company, limited, private company, public company, we are a company. I say, all right, please take me to your kitchen and show me your oven. What do you mean? We are not a, a, a restaurant or we are not anything, we are a company, we are a business. I said, you know what a company means? Compane. Com means together. Pane means bread. Do you know this word pane? Pane means bread? Latin? French? Italian? Pane. So those who come together and share the bread together, cook the bread together, eat the bread together, are a company. That's how the name company started. Now we have forgotten uh, the idea of sharing bread and we just uh, eat uh, stale sandwiches somewhere and, and, and say this is our lunch. Now I think every big business house, please have all you have this uh, boardroom, meeting room, meeting room after meeting room, officers are officer, but you say no room for the kitchen, we can't afford them. What is it? I would say have your meeting over lunch. And most important meeting is sharing, bonding together. When you want to meet somebody, say, come over for lunch. That's a bonding. Over a meal, you bond with each other. So your company will be a better company. They'll be more collegiate. Uh, they have much more uh, kind of relationship uh, among your staff and, and, and the bosses and the workers and the, and the colleagues and, and everybody together, sharing meal together. Everybody has to be, eat together. And that brings you in a common ground and a common uh, place. And so every business house, not only school and university, but every business house should have a kitchen and eating together and knowing mindfully where this food is coming from, who has grown it, how it has been grown, how it has been transported, all those things you can learn together. So food is so important, but we don't pay uh, attention to it. And I hope some of these thoughts I am telling you will remind you that food is important. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm happy to take some questions. So is this a utopian vision? Are you what Satish calls a realist? Or are you a believer that the head, heart, and hands uh, world that he advocates is possible? We'd love comments or questions. My students know that I don't single them out, but I would like to give some preference to students. Let's not have a, a discussion dominated only by the veterans. Of the yes. World. Who would like to pose our students. First, first question of the evening? At the back. Yes. Can you, can you speak a bit louder? Uh, my name is Barbara. Uh, I'm a student from School of Law. Yeah. Uh, I'm also a student of Justin. Um, my question is you mentioned, I think the trigger event you mentioned is the oil prices. It sounds like because the oil is going to run out, and that's the reason, uh, that's probably the more realistic reason that will push people to. Uh, to actually connect it with nature. Mm. If, if there is no such oil crisis, probably most of the people would um, go, the, go, go for the lifestyle you promoted. 
uh, realistically. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about, uh, what if the oil crisis is really going to happen? Do you think what you have mentioned, the vertical garden is going to save everybody from the earth? Do you think this lifestyle is really a, a life-changing event? Is it really going to change uh, if the oil crisis really happens? Is it really a uh, Yes, yes. Um, uh, the the, the um, uh, scientific data and estimates vary, uh, but peak oil is with us, more or less, is a general agreement. And uh, the demand for the oil and energy generally is increasing because many, many people in China, in India, coming from villages, they are all demanding higher living standard, higher living standard. They all want cars, they all want other things, refrigerators and so on. So peak oil, demand increasing, supply decreasing, the places where you can get oil is becoming more and more difficult. The fracking has eased a little bit in the United States and in some places, but even that is not going to last forever. And so um, uh, oil-based agriculture will face big crisis. Now, what I'm saying is that human energy is uh, not in short supply. Our hands and our muscle power and our energy. Because the earth is providing us food, so that's energy, and we are putting back into the earth to create food. So energy is recycling, and in a kind of um, circular way, cyclical way, that energy and food goes. Now, there's no one single solution to growing food. It is not that just the food on the walls and the wall gardens will feed everybody. No. What I'm suggesting is there are many, many solutions and, and there are multiple solutions, including a uh, uh, wall garden, including uh, in your windowsill uh, some pots for herbs and, and tomatoes, including a little garden in the backyard, including saving some uh, parks and some city places where there are kind of derelict places, turning them into a vegetable patch or some uh, edible gardens. And so this way, if more people put their energy, instead of oil, using oil, human power, sometime, I'm not saying that you have to be full-time gardener or farmer, so you can say three days a week, four days a week, you will work in an office or in a, a university or somewhere. But three days you would do gardening or half day gardening, half day study. So that all farmers can also have some time for intellectual and, uh, and academic and other knowledge, um, information and knowledge with them. So farmers are given opportunity to use their brains and their intellectual um, uh, interest and intellectuals and students and academics and uh, office workers and business leaders are also a little bit doing healthy exercise instead of going in a gym and st standing on a conveyor um, uh, gymnastic. Why not do a little bit of digging in the garden? I don't go in a gym but I'm 77 years old and I'm healthy because I walk and I work in the garden. My um, exercise is in the garden. So why not use your exercise, grow food at the same time, rather than every uh, day or every week going to the gym and just bicycling there um, without uh, doing anything or only compare that walking. And so what I'm saying is that we are all eating. Let's participate in the process of food all together in a small way, big way, wall garden, small garden, backyard garden, big field, small field. There are millions of solutions. There are all millions of people there finding their own solution. One solution I'm suggesting is that all of us need to participate in the process of growing and eating and cooking in a smaller way or larger way, doesn't matter. But some participation is essential if you truly want to feed the world in a sustainable manner and not depend on fossil fuel or some kind of alien energy and somebody will grow for us and we want to stay in the office in our air-conditioned room. I think that mindset has to change. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry we don't have the microphone. Do you want to come and use this microphone? It might be easier. Uh, that, that's to... okay. okay. <laughs> um, uh, as, you, as you can see, 
see online the very crowded city. And uh, but I have so I have seen a video um, calling New York people will um, farm on roof. Do you think it is a good way for Hong Kong to farm on roof? Farm on rooftop farm. Roof. Roof. Yes, yes, yes. I mentioned about the wall garden, roof gardens as well. But my preference for roofs is solar power. Maybe you can have a mixture. A part roof could be solar panels and part roof could be garden. But I feel that we need to shift our um, energy source from fossil fuel, which is creating global warming, climate change, and, and the fossil fuel will run out anyway. And the sun energy is eternal, infinite. With millions of years, it will be there. Mm. And so why not harvest solar energy? So every roof in Hong Kong, and how many roofs do you have? Millions of them. Let every roof become a solar collecting, energy producing power station, powerhouse. And every roof in China, every roof in India, just imagine how many roofs are there in the world. If all of them were collecting solar energy, what, how many jobs it would create? to create solar panels, and then how much energy will become self-sufficient. So my preference would be to use solar energy for roof, at least part of the roof. But at the same time, some part of the roof can also be uh, edible garden. And in New York, in, uh, in, in, uh, in London, uh, there is a supermarket. They are growing uh, food on the, on the roof and selling in the supermarket. A small supermarket doing it. So that's a very good idea. So wall garden and the roof gardens, wonderful. Any other question? Yes, please. Um, hello. hello. You suggest a uh, slow lifestyle, but uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not very realistic in nowadays society. Uh, you know, everyone works so fast, and the challenge is so fierce. Uh, so if you walk slowly, that means you will fall behind others. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, maybe our society uh, might not develop. So uh, I want to Yes. Ask yes. Um, depends on um, your idea of development. Uh, and the, the societies, when they were going slowly, they were not undeveloped societies. When we had the Buddha hmm, in India, how did Buddha emerge if society was undeveloped? We had Shakespeare, we had Lao Tzu in China, it was not undeveloped society. And now, after so many hundreds of years, the Shakespeare is still produced in every country in the world, or most countries in the world. He was not a fast writer, but he produced lots of plays. So this idea, the speed will give you development and high quality is not, there's no evidence for that. And I have evidence that people who went slowly achieved tremendous real development, real development. So uh, Gandhi was going slowly. What did he achieve? Music. Van Gogh, he did not paint his picture quickly. Hmm? He painted pictures slowly and now we can buy his picture only with, if you have a 50 million dollars or something. So development does not mean speed. Development means deeper. Develop means more harmonious. Develop means more proportion, more balance, more beauty, more, more wisdom. That is development. Just getting speed and getting somewhere quickly and then you don't know. Now in England, they want to build a train between London and Birmingham. And it's a very fast train they want to build. And what will they save? 20 minutes on the train. For that 20 minutes, they are ruining the countryside. They are uh, upsetting lots of people who live nearby. Many, many houses will be removed and they will build this railway. I say, rather than going 20 minutes quicker, go 20 minutes slower and read something in your train. Relax, have a little nap in your train. So when you come to Birmingham, you are fresh. You are awake when you are working, working, working fast, fast, fast. Then you are arriving in the office meeting and you are tired. You are exhausted. The quality of your meeting will not be so good. 
So being relaxed, being slowly, the quality will increase. The quantity may go down, but quality will increase. What is better? M more development. Quality or quantity? So what I'm saying is that you will be ahead of other people in quality. You may be behind in quantity, but you will be ahead in quality. And the quality will shine more than the quantity. I didn't think I'd have to do this to someone who's not a student to pose a question. Yes. Patty. Yes. We are doing growing on the roof in a little way here with help from Kaduri Farm. Yes. We have our grow project on the roof of AT2. And this is a little advertisement. 10 o'clock this Friday, the team's there. If somebody wants to join, we are short of people. Because the city youth students, yeah. they are very busy on their studies. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them, they need money. Yeah. So they are working part time. Yeah. So when we say, come and grow things on the roof, ah, I'm too busy. Yeah. It yeah. Is not, I do not earn credits on my course. Yeah. I do not earn money. Yeah. I'm too busy. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. First of all, congratulations that you have a roof garden. That's wonderful news. And the second thing, that people are very busy. Yes, they are busy because they have been conditioned to think that passing exam and, and working in a cafe to earn a bit of money is more important than connecting with nature. And so what we need to do is a re-education, bringing awareness, like you just said to people here. Now these people, some of them know, and after hearing me and hearing you, maybe one or two or five might come to your place. So we need to sow the seeds, again metaphorically, and bring this awareness to people. And then if you persist, if you persist, slowly, 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 shanay, 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 people will come. They will be attracted to you. So my urge to you is don't give up. Congratulations for starting that project, and people will come slowly. I, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yes. Please. Since you're so close, do you want to use yeah. the microphone so everybody hears you? I just wanted to make a comment. Um, at Hong Kong New, we also have a roof garden. Anybody is, if you're free on Friday at 3 p.m., come. <laughs> I'm delighted. I'm delighted that uh, universities are starting roof gardens. Wonderful. I'm so happy. So happy. Please spread the word. Any other question? Please. I'd like, like to join in this. Uh, the, we've installed roof gardens in nearly 50 schools in Hong Kong. Yes. And the children get it. Yeah. Even from preschool. Yeah. They love it. Yeah. They absolutely love gardening. Yeah. And they get it. They understand it immediately. Wonderful. Congratulations. Very good. I'm so glad to hear all these comments and projects. OK. Anyone else? Okay, okay, okay. One last one. Last question. I really want to know how can we break the circle of a scenario that uh, the oil base agriculture actually controlled by the few uh, very big co uh, national corporations. They, uh, they control the sea. Control the seed, the corporations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is this is a one big question that at the moment uh, a few big corporations are controlling the seed supply and also food supply. And in my view, if you really wish to have quality food and diversity of food and not this monoculture. Because the monoculture, hybrid or genetically engineered seeds, they have side effects. Un 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 what called, um, unintended. unintended. Unintended consequences. And so at the moment, for example, lots and lots of people, particularly I know in England, have tremendous uh, allergy for wheat. Because wheat has tremendous amount of gluten. But this wheat, which is hybrid, or GMO wheat, it's a different kind of wheat, which is not the kind of wheat I used to eat in my childhood, or even now I buy what is called spelt wheat, which is the old um, local variety, uh, which has no such gluten. And so um, 
there are lots of problems with having monoculture, uh, one kind of seed everywhere, in every land. Because each soil is different, each country is different, and you cannot have one kind of seed, one kind of food everywhere growing and in the shelves and in the supermarkets and, and, and a monoculture. So maintaining biodiversity in food is an essential step in feeding the world. The moment we become monoculture, per acre of one single crop will increase maybe, but the variety of food will go down and the totality of food production will go down. And this has been scientifically calculated and studied and evidence is there, you can study it. So I think rescue your food away from these big few corporations, your seeds, and have diversity of seeds, local seeds, and seeds which can grow back. The, the GMO seeds or even hybrid seeds, you can't reuse them. So you, you become dependent on the suppliers of those seeds. And so that dependence of millions of farmers around the world, if they become dependent on few companies, that's a new kind of dictatorship. That's not democracy. Democracy is people power. People are empowered to sow their seeds, save, um, save their seeds, protect their seeds, and biodiverse farming in local conditions, local climate, local soil, local uh, um, situations. That is true democracy of food. So I would say, um, free food from big corporations. So thank you very much. So after a lecture on slowing down, I hope Satish will allow me one exception, and that is some students are quite busy right now. What I'd like to do is invite those students who are in a rush to step outside and uh, meet Satish for five or ten minutes. If you're able to...